Okay, I think we've got uh, a lot of people starting to come in, so I'm just going to go ahead and start. It's, we're on day three of this five-day webinar on CMS Flow, CMS Wave, and the SMS. So today I'm going to be going over, um, starting where we left off yesterday, we added the different coverages, defined our boundary conditions, our activity classification, and um, also the quad tree resolution and grid frame area. So um, I'm going to be going over how to actually take all that information, actually start a grid, edit the model parameters for CMS flow, <coughs> and then explain a few things about how it's running and things like that. And later on, I'll go through a demo of all that. And uh, following all that, if we have enough time, I think we will, I'm going to start a presentation on CMS Wave and just go over some of the background for it and some of its capabilities. So yesterday we left off, and this is pretty much what uh, we had um, in our SMS window. So we have a scatter set that we went through and developed on day one. And then yesterday we added in the boundary conditions, activity classification, and quad tree generator. And um, then we eventually converted this quad tree uh, grid frame into an actual grid, which is sitting up here. Um, and so that's based on the resolution that we had uh, prescribed when we were defining the grid. Um, so the next steps that we need to do, we need to add all this together into a what we're calling a simulation. So this is a little bit different than the way we handled everything in previous versions of SMS. Um, from now on, we're kind of covering things as far as uh, drag and drop kind of uh, situation to form various simulations. You can have um, use any of these or others and just pull them into your simulations and I'll show you how to do that. So the first thing you need to do is load the project from the previous uh, day. So I put today's um, files under day three in the folder that I've given you on the website. Hopefully that's working. I tried it and it looks like it is. Um, and there's a webinar folder and we saved it right there. So just click on that uh, SMS file and um, load it up into SMS. And once you have it loaded, what we would end up doing is go over into the data tree on the left-hand side, and we'd right-click, and we choose New Simulation, and we're going to add CMS Flow to that simulation. And when we do that, you wind up with a section down here in the data tree that basically says Simulation Data. And we're going to be working with CMS Flow Simulations. And you can change the name of this simulation to whatever you want. So if you're only doing one, it might be okay to just leave it as sim. But if you eventually will be doing a number of different uh, simulations based on what we're showing here today, maybe an existing condition or several alternatives, you would want to name these things appropriately and all of your, your map data for each one of those so that you know which ones go with which. So I'm just going to leave it named sim for right now. Um, and so the next step is to just basically pull your boundary conditions down into the simulation and the activity classification into the simulation. And you just kind of grab those. You'll see a line here that kind of shows up right underneath the word sim. And then when you see that, you just let go and then they show right there in the simulation. Um, now the, the next thing is our quad tree. So you don't want to, you want to make sure that you do not choose the quad tree generator coverage to bring down here. You want the actual grid that we developed and we created. So you would come up here and grab this and then uh, pull it down to underneath your simulation. And so now would be a good time to go ahead and save your grid. Make sure you have everything up to this point. I know it was, you know, relatively quick and easy to get there. So you can never save too much. So the next thing you need to do 
Um, everything that we're going to do from now on is basically under these simulations. So we want to right click um, on simulation. And you have a couple of options here. And what we're going to do right now is go into the model control. And so this is the model control where we define all of the different parameters and things that CMS is going to be doing. It controls when it starts, um, how long it's going to run, what features we're going to be running with, like if we're going to turn on instead of the transport, and if so, then what kind of parameters we're going to have there. Um, and so we would go into that model control. Uh, let me just kind of demonstrate that real quick in the SMS, and then we can get into actually uh, entering some values for our um, simulation. So we go under uh, and open this webinar uh, project file like we were instructed. All right, and we have our grid over here, um, the scatter sets, and the three things. So we just right click, got a new simulation, and pull in or click on CMS flow, and add that simulation there. And then we can either one at a time drag these down, or if you want to select multiple things, um, you can do that too, and then pull those down under simulation. And then also the same thing with the quad tree generator grid, which you can name to whatever you want. You can right-click here, rename this to where it makes a little bit more sense about what kind of grid, what area you're working in, things like that. So I always go in here and rename it. But right now, we're just going to keep that the same. And we've added these three components to our simulation. So next thing we do, um, we go into model control. So we'll right-click on the simulation. And we can go into model control. And this is what it looks like. And I'll just widen this up um, so you can see everything. So basically, we have a series of tabs that contain different types of information for <coughs> our CMS grid. And so um, what we're going to do is we're just going to go through and start entering some of this information into the um, the model control, so let me move things over a little bit so where I can see everything. And I'll go back in there and do that. So I'll show you how this works. So, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start our run under the general tab, as it shows here. Um, and we're just going to change the date to 1-1-2001. You can also click over here and find a, a calendar and enter that information. Um, but sometimes it's just as easy just to enter that information. So that's 12 o'clock a.m. is when we're going to start. And so important to note, this is relative to Greenwich Mean Time. So this is a universal time um, that we're running in here. All of the forcing that you do uh, should be relative to Greenwich Mean Time. And um, I guess it's also called UTC. And then um, everything can be coordinated and going appropriately. We do it with the, the Greenwich Mean Time mainly because when we're working with tile constituents and everything, it's hard keeping track of what regions all of these are for. So everybody references those back to uh, GMT. So anyway, we do the same thing. It's just important to note that when you're working with your own data, local data, that it needs to also be referenced to that same time uh, time zone. All right, so the next thing on the list is uh, change the simulation duration. We're going to go for 744 hours. And so I guess that's about 31 days. If you wanted to, you could enter 31, change the drop-down, uh, I guess change the drop-down first, and then enter the number. So um, whatever you want to do, it's there's options here to do that. The so ramp duration, just explanation of what the ramp does, it basically minimizes the, all the forcing conditions when you initially start for a certain amount of time, and that's the first period. Um, and that basically helps the model start up um, easier, and it does not you know, cause any instability too quickly. So it gives you a little bit of time where you can gradually 
get all the water moving and flows and everything that you need to before you get to the full portion. So just take note that that 24-hour period or whatever you specify there um, when you're looking at your results. And so you'll have a little bit of an oddity at the very beginning where everything looks very small, but it's because of that ramp duration. The next thing we're going to do, I'm going to skip over some of these other things. I will go ahead and <coughs> talk about it. So basically we have the capability to write out files as we're going uh, so that we can hot start from those layers. Say we're running for, you know, a year or two years and it's going to take a while and you want to make sure that you have something in case your computer crashes or, you know, ASIS sometimes just reboots your machine for no reason. So, you know, a lot of times it's nice to go ahead and set that. Uh, hot start, we have it defaulted to be on and writing out information every 24 hours. Um, well, at 24 hours and then every half an hour uh, as well. There's two different files there. And so you can start from either one of those um, later on. We're not going to cover that in this uh, webinar, but um, in the future one we might be able to get into that and describe how to do that. So the next thing down here is our solution scheme. There, as I mentioned on the first day, there's two different solution schemes. One is an implicit, where we can have a little bit larger time steps. Um, and the other is explicit, and it's sub-second uh, time steps for running individual cells, and um, it helps when you have large areas or wetting and drying, or basically when you have to reduce your time step so much for your grid um, that it really becomes cost prohibitive to do it in an implicit manner because um, there's a convergence and iterations that it has to go through for that. So uh, just make your choice. We default to implicit, and the matrix solver we default to the one that has typically run the best for us, but there are several options if you want to try them out. Number of threads, this is for parallelization on your machine. So for implicit, the maximum number really is four, uh, just because of the way our routines were optimized and we're working on you know, getting it optimized for more threads and more uh, available on PCs. Uh, but for right now, the maximum that we can use are four, and so you can change that. So the next tab is flow, and we're going to be working with the implicit, so we have a 600-second time step. So, you know, you can enter that in minutes or hours or whatever you want to do, but 600 is perfectly fine. Um, Wetting and drying depth, this is essentially as the water, the tides come in and out, um, cells are exposed at lower tides. Uh, when the amount of water gets beyond this threshold, 0.05 meters, then CMS considers those cells as dry. And so you would just want to make sure that you're, you have a reasonable number here. Uh, this is one of the, the particular items that we sometimes move, you know, we'll change it from 0.05 to 0.1, 0.12, something like that. That needs to be reasonable, and you have to be able to explain why you're doing that. You know, some of the other things, um, average latitude, you can say from the projection, you know, remember on the first day we set our projection to be fake plane, so it doesn't, you know, SMS doesn't really know until this point what the latitude is for the Coriolis effect. And so what this is telling us is that CMS is going to get the average latitude from our project as decided um, by the, the data set that we've got and the projection that we're using. If for whatever reason we wanted to do an idealized situation where we don't want to include Coriolis, we can just give a user specified value of zero degrees latitude and that'll turn off Coriolis and then you can see that. But, you know, typically we're going to be running in real-world situations and we'll want to get the use the latitude for the appropriate area. Some of these other um, options, they're not really um, changed too often. Um, the turbulence type of model, you can uh, work with that a little bit. There's some parameters that we kind of hide from you guys, but um, they're, they're set up there. We, we recommend just using those defaults. Um, very few times have we modified those values and seen any real effects. So we're just, we have them available, but right now we have them hidden from you. So um, types of friction, 
event float coefficient. You can specify that. Um, we can turn on wall friction, and essentially what that is on cells that are right next to a land or a um, non-computational cell will double the friction. So we'll, we'll have a bottom friction that's specified in the next little step, and we'll also have an additional amount of friction on the, the edge that's next to um, land. So the next thing is bottom roughness data set. We're going to modify this a little bit later on in the presentation, and so I'm just going to leave this be for right now. Um, so we'll get back to that in a few minutes. So then there's sediment transport. And so for right now, we're just going to turn it on. Uh, and that enables a lot of other parameters that we can work with. And I'll go into that in just a little while. Um, but basically, this is governing. We're turning on uh, sediment transport. And we're telling the model what type of transport it's going to be doing. So everything right now in CMS is for non-cohesive types of sediment. And so you want to make sure that your grain sizes are appropriately big and uh, with, with the understanding that we're working with sand here and not silt and clays and um, things like that. We are adding in some cohesive type um, capabilities that will be available within the next year. Um, but for right now, it's not in here, and so we're going to leave it on. Um, some of the other just um, properties for the sediment transport, I'll go in, up to these later on. There's some scaling factors that if you're not getting the appropriate movement and quantities being moved, you can play with that factor just a little bit. Um, and then we define our sediment size classes, either one size class or more. Um, in this particular um, project we're going to do, we're only going to work with one size class. Uh, and one layer in the bed. And so we'll get into that in just a few minutes. Um, and then we have the avalanching capability and the hard bottom. So for right now, we're just going to turn that on. And then we'll go over and I'll explain the salinity and temperature window. So you can actually turn on working with salinity. And you have to get your initial conditions from somewhere, either from a data set or from a, a constant value. So that's basically the choice here. Um, so right now, we're going to work with this off. Um, but in the advance, we're probably going to show uh, a couple of cases where we've turned this on and some of the results that we've gotten. This is a very simplified 2D salinity. So we only really want to use this in areas that we know are well mixed. So you don't want to use this and expect good results if you're in a really stratified uh, area. So just take that into consideration. Temperature, this is working for you know evaporation in days that might be uh, a little bit farther off and they don't get a lot of input from you know the behind the barrier island or anything like that. So we can turn on temperature and add some information there to get a little bit more evaporation. Um, and we're like I said, we're gonna be probably covering that later on this year as well. So the next option is wave, so this we'll get into this tomorrow. Um, as we after we talk about the CMS wave grid, um, basically we can interact with our waves uh, with an inline steering or we can pre-run the waves and then specify these data sets um, that hold those solutions. Um, for the most part we do the inline steering, um, but for now we're just going to turn that off and do none. Um, we can have different types of wind, either a spatially constant wind. So we're just specifying here a time and the direction of velocity. And this is applied over the entire grid the same value through time. Um, specify the anemometer height. Um, there's also options to do more than one meteorological station. Um, so that's a possibility. And then we can also have different inputs from, say, fleet numeric winds and things like that uh, that we have that were from other databases and we get those from other people. We have to know certain parameters. Um, all of this is stuff that we're going to get into during a more advanced uh, talk, but I wanted to go over just a little bit about that. The next tab is for your output. And so essentially this is telling CMS that I want to see 
early calculations at specific times. And so <clears throat> you may not want to see, you know, every six minutes of uh, morphology change. It doesn't change that fast. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And so you have the capability with CMS to specify up to four lists of various times and then assign those to the types of information that you want to get out of it. So in this case, we're going to set um, list one. Uh, we are going to run with a half hour increment for that output. And we're going to make sure that it is specified for the entire time. We do default for some information um, to go ahead and come out every hour for the first 30 days. Um, just because in the past we've had some people that forget this tab, and then they wind up and they have zero output, and they don't understand why, because it took a day to run. So anyway, we turn this on. Um, for list two, you see there's no boxes here, so we need to insert a row. Um, we're going to go from starting at zero hours, for every three hours, for a total of 744 hours. And then the same thing for list three, we're going to do zero hours every one hour for 744 hours, and then come down to the bottom and kind of make the decisions on which ones we want to use. So we'll leave water surface elevation at list one. We'll leave current velocity at list one. You can turn on current magnitude if you want, um, but you're always going to get a velocity vector, and you're always going to get a water sur surface elevation scalar value. Um, we're going to turn on morphology output and change the list to list 2. And you can look at morphology change if you want. It can always be computed later. Uh, so that's a toggle on or off. You just make your choice what you want to do. Um, transport rates. And so we're going to choose list 3. So we want to see those every hour. We only want morphology every 3 hours. And then you have different um, types of output that you can you know, turn on as well to be able to look at. And same thing for waves and wind and any viscosity values. Uh, we can output those and look at those for time as well. There's some statistical output. So we can turn those on if we want to get a little bit more information about why things are happening and what's, what's going on in the background that's not part of our uh, true solution. So if you start having some issues, you might go ahead and turn these on and then um, enable that type of output for hydrodynamics or and or sediment transport and salinity. So um, if you need these for here, you just have to check the box and then go in and edit those. Uh, we're not going to go into that this time. We're going to cover that later um, because there's a lot of information in those statistics that um, we can we can cover. It would take up too much time for this basic course. Some other little output um, options down here. Um, for the most part, we're just going to work on windows, so we want binary output, and we're going to keep the rest the same. And uh, at the very top now, we move the simulation label from the very bottom to the very top, just so you can uh, name the solution something that's meaningful. A lot of people um, forgot that it was down there, and so every time they ran something, it always came in with the folder name um, simulation. So they had alternatives that they were loading in. They were trying to do comparisons, everything that loaded to the same folder. So if you change the name for each simulation, then you'll wind up with different folders, and it's a lot easier to look at the output. OK, so that's all we really want to set up for right now. Um, so I'm going to click OK, and then go back to the presentation. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is there are, there are different data sets that can control different features. So a lot of times we need to specify a bottom roughness. And that can come in the form of commanding then. Here, I'll go ahead and pull this back over and show you real quick. Um, so I'll go back into model control. So for bottom roughness, there are options for manning VIN type of roughness, a bottom friction coefficient, and a roughness site. You can make your choice. And then the values that they default to are dependent on which choice you make. 
So for manning then is what we normally default to. You would come in here and click select. And then it, you see that there's none selected right now, so we need to create a data set. And so that's what we're going to do here. So you create a data set. It brings you right into the calculator. And these are values that are going to be assigned for our bottom friction. So our typical value that we use is 0.025. Um, as the default, you might have different values that you typically use depending on your area and your, your setup. But this is the default that we normally go with here. Um, and then we can give this a name, names, and make sure you hit the compute button. Otherwise, you don't wind up with a new data set. You can see that's located here. You click Done. And you see it shows up there. We can click OK and come out and we see it showing up in the, the grid. So that's essentially what this is showing. Um, we click Create, it brings in the data calculating, you put in a value and a name, hit Compute, and it winds up in the interface. So that's, that's pretty good. You've got your default set, but there may be places in the grid where you want to modify this bottom uh, roughness, the friction coefficient, that you're going to be using because of turbulence or whatever reason. And so um, areas that could be are like around bridge abutments. So we defined um, a couple of areas here based on what the visual um, from the image. And so we see three areas here that we're going to set at a slightly different uh, value um, as opposed to the default up here. So I've modified the range that we're showing here so they kind of show up a little bit easier. But essentially, you go in and you will select these um, values or these cells um, with a polygon. So under in the SMS window, you would go under Edit and select with a polygon, click out um, the shape that you want to select the cells. They're all selected, and then you, at the very top, you have this window that has your X location, Y location, Z value, and if you have more than one cell selected, this is the average depth for those cells. And then you have an S column here. So this is the value that we're going to modify for these different data sets. It's just a bit of scalar data set is what the S is for. And so with those selected, you just go in here, erase what value there was before and put in your own value. And in this case, we put in 0.3. And for some strange reason, SMS sometimes makes it a very, very small difference, um, either plus or minus there. So that's what's kind of showing up there. Um, anyway, so the value is about 0.03 for those. And then I've done the same thing for this section and that section of the grid as well. And that has essentially uh, increase the friction values that we're using right around those bridges. Uh, there may be other areas, groins, jetties, um, other things that you want to increase or decrease the um, the reference values. So that's essentially how you do that. The other type of data set that you want to do this for is also your grain sizes. And so um, you have the options for um, setting a D50, and you also have a, a slew of other different um, sentiment point classes that you can set as well. But for the most part, if you if you only have one grain size and you only have one layer, you really only need to specify what the average distribution is. And so we do that with the D50 um, data set. And so what you do is come back into model control um, under the sediment transport tab towards the bottom so it's a section for size classes. And so you come in and it normally has no um, rows here, so you would need to insert a row and then enter a value for the diameter. There's some other options that are rarely used. I've never used them in my 10 years plus of using um, CMS. So we're making we're kind of hiding those in future versions. Um, but for for now, they're available. Um, but we want to make sure that we get the average uh, diameter grain size. This is the main um, grain size that we are going to be transporting in um, CMS. And so under that, 
is the band composition. And so you can specify what the band looks like in multiple layers um, for that area. And so that's also done with the data set. And I'll show this in a demo in just a second. Um, but basically, you come in here, you also have to insert a row or multiple rows if you're having multiple layers. Um, but then you would come in, scroll over to find different data sets you want to modify this D50. And just like we did with the main then we click this, create a new data set, assign a value, and in this case we're using 0.26 as our median grain size, um, give it a name of D50, click OK, and then it shows up in the grid just like we showed before. So just to demonstrate that just real quick, to come back over here, and I will go into model control, the sediment transport tab, scroll to the bottom, and so we'll insert a row and change the value to 0 0.026. And just to get an idea of what the other options are, follow velocity methods and parameters and query shape factors for the chair scope, um, you can stress all that, but we recommend, you know, that you kind of trust CMS unless you really have values that you know that you want to use and test out. So also for the bed composition, uh, you insert one row. It's the zero layer. You don't have to give it a number or anything. Um, if there's just one row, you don't have to worry about a thickness. Um, but you scroll over and you come to the D50, and you want to click the button, tell it to create, and then we're going to give it a value, 0.26 and a name, D50, click Compute, and done. You see it shows up there, and when you come out, it shows up in your grid as a data set underneath uh, all your other data sets in the grid. All right? And so similarly, there may be times where you want to change the values that are in a certain area. So just as an example here, uh, we've got our same grid that we've been working with, I've zoomed into the inlet. Um, we're working with an area here near the jetties, and so the velocities are pretty strong. And so maybe um, with over time, it's taken out some of the finer material and moved them away, and so what's left in this area are coarser material. And so what we've done here is we've set three different areas. Um, for the largest, the easiest way to do this is go from the largest down. You can just click out and select a region, make sure they're selected, and then just as we did above, um, we go to that S value, we make sure we're on the D50 data set, and then change that S value. And so for this one, for the large section, I made a 0.4. Um, I created a smaller little region inside and made a 0.5. And then another small region right here where we have a little bit of uh, extra scour going on and made it a little bit coarser material still. All right. And that just removes some of the, the smaller grain sizes in these areas so you don't get that movement. Um, it's a little bit harder to move these grain sizes. All right. Um, so now I, I'll just go back and show you. I didn't want to do that. show you how to do um, both the D50 and the Manning Zoom. So we would go over here into the Quantry Generator. We would select the Manning Zoom data set. And so one of the things, I'll widen this a little bit. Um, so one of the things we want to do is we can actually turn some of this off. Um, you notice we don't see anything uh, in the background. So we can go back and load in our image if we want. So let me go find that image. Oops, that's not it. Where did I put that? Right, here we go. And so we open the tip image, it comes in, it's processing, and we see what um, the area looks like. Um, you notice the color here is all one color, 
And that's because we're looking at the Manning then, and we're looking at a range of negative 5 to 20. That's what I had said originally. So it's down here in this yellow color. So if we want to look at the Manning then uh, color scheme, we can go into um, our applied tree contours and change some of these values to see the range that we're going to be putting in. So I'm just going to put in 0 0.025 up to about 0 0.03. And I'm going to change some of these um, intervals. And then make it right, right there. And then I'm going to add linear contours just to easier see what we're doing here. All right, and that kind of gives another little color here. So we can zoom in to this bridge. And under Edit, there's a Select by, OK, well, we need to actually select cells. So there's a, a button here we showed over here in the PowerPoint. So we select those cells. And under Edit, Select by, and actually, there's a Select with Polygon. I didn't see it. So select with polygon, and then now you can just click, and you see you've got a polygon started, and just click out the shape that you want to select. And so I'll just select those cells, and you see the, the average D value for those cells is 4.75, but this S value is the default that we created, the 0.025. And so we would change this value to 0.03, we hit enter, and it, for every cell that we have specified or selected, it changes the value. Um, and you can kind of see that represented in the color change here. So if I turn off the image, you see the area selected. You can see that the values are different for those uh, cells. And we'll do the same thing for the other side as well. So there's another bridge here. We'll do both of these at the same time. And so um, I will come back under here, select with polygon, and I'll select the cells that I want. All right. And then if I want to add more to that, I'll hold down the Shift button. I'll also select with polygon. I hold down the Shift button now. And I'll choose um, a different set of values here. All right, and this is going across a little bit of the land, but it's not going to compute anything on land, so I'm not too worried about that. I'm going to changing again this value 0.03 enter, and once again the color has changed for the cells. And that just shows that you're going to be representing a little bit different friction value. Uh, for those cells. And so here's what it looks like um, after you get finished with those. So moving on, we're going to go to the D50 data set now. And you notice all of this changes again. Everything's different. That's because it's a totally different data set. They've got a different value for the scalar values. So we're going to go back in and change the display options um, for the range that we're going to be using. So I'm going to be using 0 0.26 as the base, but I'm going to go all the way up to 0 0.6 number of millimeter range sizes. All right, we see the values over here. We can make more or fewer um, intervals that we want, and we'll click OK. So I want to zoom into the area that I want to modify. And so again, I'll select cells. And with a polygon, and I'll just kind of click out an area. And you may have some areas already defined or described in a, a shape file from RTIS or something like that. So you might use those um, polygons, bring them in, and use those to yourself. Um, but in this case, we're just going to kind of click it out ourselves. So I'm just going to start out and make um, a little bit of a shape that is for this area. All right, those are selected. And I'll change the value here to 0.4. You 
can see the color changed a little bit. And now I will just change a smaller section. So again, selecting with a polygon. I'll select a little area inside of this um, that represents a little bit even coarser material. And this is just an example. I'm just clicking this out, so you would want to pay a little bit more attention. So this value is going to be 0 0.5. And you see that's now changed. And then we have a small little area um, in one section that I will make even coarser still. Okay, and then you can zoom out and look at, you know, your results. And you want to do this in the different areas that you want to, to modify. So that's just one way to do that. Um, once you're finished setting these, these are all still, if I go back to my Mannings, you can see that um, it's changed, but of course the colors aren't such that you can see it right now. Um, but if I look at the value, it's now 0.03. So um, there are, there is a way in SMS that you can specify for each data set its own contour values. You don't have to keep going up to display options and changing these full ranges every time. Um, sadly, it's not working right now in this version for me. So, um, suppose I wanted to turn that on, I would right click on each data set and say I want to do data set specific contour options. And then I would fill in the values that I want. And so for here, it shows you what the range is, uh, and you can either use that entire range or specify a subset, um, whatever you want to do. And normally, when you come back out, if that's set and you're selected, then it would override the global. But right now, it is not working. So that makes it a little bit more difficult to go back and forth and look at these different things, especially if you're looking from your depth values and then maybe you're, you've loaded in some solutions and you're looking at um, morphology change or something like that. So it's going to make it a little bit difficult, but this has been fixed in later versions. I was using a version last week, uh, 1307, and it was working fine. So um, this has been fixed in a later version. So um, back to the PowerPoint to see where we are. All right, so there's another one that I'm not going to go into um, that you can also set like this. Um, and that is basically the hard bottom value. So if you're working with sediment transport and you're working in an area where there's an underlying rocky outcrop under some sand and you know where that is and you want to specify the values or the depth of that section, um, you can do that. And it's done in a similar way. I'll kind of show you, but it's not in the notes. Um, but essentially it's in model control sediment transport at the very bottom, there is turning on hard bottom. And so you can select the data set like we've done before, um, give it a name, and the value. And so I believe the initial value, um, the default is to allow free sand movement, no restrictions. And so the um, value that you would use to identify that is a native 999. That's just an identifier in SMS that says we're treating this as a special number. And any time it sees that, it's going to say, okay, I can move as much sediment from this cell as I want. Otherwise, if it's an actual value, then it's the actual depth at which that um, said that hard bottom is located. So we'll just tell it to compute and come back out. And also it shows up here. And so if I know I have certain areas, so maybe one of the things we want to do with a hard bottom is to maybe say, okay, for my jetties, I don't want to, 
allow them to erode any material around them. They have a base and whatever, so I might want to set a certain value for my jettings or my groins. Um, but typically, you're looking at areas within the normal computational area, and you'd specify a certain depth at which that um, rocky material is where you don't have any more sand that can erode, and will only be able to erode down to that point. So that's how you would do it, the same way you've done this before with the other two data sets. We're just not going to cover it in this material. So I'm going to delete that back out. And um, then make sure it's turned off in my model control. And then I can proceed. So um, once you have the grid and all the parameters set and all your specific values for these data sets, defined like you want them. Of course, you want to save the grid. Um, and so you can just go under here and save your project or save as. I've already got one loaded, um, saved out, so I'm not going to overwrite it right now, but I will go back in real quick. So I'm going to open this back out, go back into day three and then after model control. So I've got this already loaded, um, saved, and I'm just bringing in the same thing um, already situated. All right, and so we have this area. We have the Manning Pen. We have the V50 data set, um, the simulation. We've got model control with value set as we wanted them. Um, and we're ready to go. And so the next step is essentially um, to right-click on the simulation and just tell it to export some files. And so that's what we're going to do. So we'll export CMS flow, and it has a model checker built in. And so we've got a few little issues. And so this is something we're trying to work out um, in the interface. We have to, we're only running with one um, D50 class, we don't need the D60 through 95 or the D5 through 35, but it's telling us we do. And also a thickness, we've only got one layer, it doesn't matter. So we're working on, you know, getting these um, issues removed from this model checker or at least checked um, appropriately. But we can ignore them right now. We're just going to tell it to export the file. And so it's out there and it's working, and then we're going to show you um, basically what is going on. Actually, there's, I think I jumped ahead a little bit. So let me, when this is finished, I'll go back and actually show one more little thing that you need to look at before you start exporting and running. Because it'll give you errors, um, especially when you're first starting out and setting up these grids. So I'm going to go back to um, the grid. And you see I'm showing the cell edges here. You can see in, I've got the map data and all these um, coverages loaded into the simulation. You can see where the flow rate forcing is. And so what you want to do is go into the edges and see where exactly is my forcing cell string going to attach itself. Because right now it's just in the arc. Um, and so what you can do is select boundary conditions in your simulation go into um, display options under map and turn on the snap preview. And it shows you can, there's a shortcut to do shift and one letter two. Um, but basically when you turn this on, it essentially comes back and it shows you where the cell strain is going to be applying this boundary condition um, and what cells are going to be affected. So if you need to move a point down here to get an additional cell um, added into that, you want to go ahead and do it now. Or if you don't want, you know, as many or as close to shore, you can move that off. And this updates in real time and shows you where that's going to be. Um, so when you get relatively close, it doesn't really matter. Um, one thing you want to make sure, though, is that this point is not inside the grid. So these would be fine, but these cells that are inside and not on the external edge here, 
is going to cause a problem when you start running CMS. Um, and it'll probably give you either an error message or it'll just bomb. Um, so if that happens, come back and look and make sure that all of your cell strings that are being defined are along this edge on the side of your grid. And you want to do that for the entire uh, domain. And so it looks okay for there. I'm coming up. I'm zooming in. Okay, and so everything looks fine. Um, I may move this a little bit farther in. Um, and then I'm good to go. Everything looks fine. And I'll turn that back off, Shift Q. Make sure we save our project. And then go back and run our export. So I'll do that now. I'll ignore this uh, model checker issues. And then I'll open a, a folder and just kind of show you what's going on. So when you're exporting these files, Basically, when you save the project, you only get these files here. It's not really the information that CMS knows anything about. It doesn't have any parameters or data sets or anything like that in a format that CMS knows. So when we're exporting those CMS files, they're being written into subdirectory under this main directory. And so the way it's doing it is let me go back to the pr uh, presentation. It's using the following um, way to write this directory structure. So basically, it starts with the project name. And so that's the name that we save our project. So workshop, Shark River, underscore 13.0. And then it creates a directory for CMS flow. And that's essentially because this is a CMS flow type simulation. You may have other simulations. You have an answer simulation or an ADH or something like that. And so you want to make sure that these are separated and run in their own space. And so it's created this subdirectory for seamless flow. And then the actual simulation name here, we just left a sim, and that's what it puts as the last um, subdirectory here. So if you go back and look, we've got the project name, and it goes into seamless flow. It's got the simulation. You can have multiple simulations for seeing them flow in the each from your own folder. So it's in the sim folder. Then we have this, um, our cards that we are used to seeing for CMS. And so if I go back here, it kind of explains what these are. So the MP file basically contains all of our boundary conditions. Um, basically, if any information that's specified that isn't a component for every cell in the grid. Um, we don't need to maintain such a big uh, structure to hold all that information. So it basically holds a smaller amount of information. Um, the data set that H5 is the one that actually holds all of that cell-specific information, all the D50 information, manning them, but we have a value assigned to every cell in the grid. And so it stores that information in the data set. Then there's this world cell. This is, this is a misnomer. It's, it's actually a bug that's in SMS 13 um, that we had a workaround for, but they write off this world cell. CMS actually uses a .tel, not a world cell. Um, but essentially, that file holds the geometry. It's how the, the cells, where they're located, what the depth values are, and how they're connected to each other. Um, things like that, cells that are identified as non-computational and computational, all that's written in that file. And then the CM cards file is all the parameters. It's the start date. It's turning on sediment transport with certain data sets being specified. So it gives information in this file about where to look within these other files to find the information that it needs to run with. Um, and so these four files are going to be written out. Um, and then CMS is able to be run through the interface. Um, normally, we sometimes run 
CMS outside of SMS, we could just open up a command prompt and go. But we need to run it at least one time inside of SMS to make sure we get a better version of this tail file. And I'll show you kind of what that looks like in a minute. Um, so we've got these same files here. And let me just go back to the, the demo. So we've got those already written out. And so the next step would be just to come here and tell SMS that we want to launch in the next flow. So we'll click this button. Again, we get the model checker that gives us a few issues. Forget about it. Just go and launch. And a window will pop up. It's the simulation run queue. And it tells us there's two things that it's doing. One thing is this tail fix. It's an iterative, uh, intermediate process where they change that world tail into a dot tel. It's just they, they're writing out some wrong information um, and not what CMS wants. So normally you don't really need to worry about that too much. But then you can click down here and look at the actual CMS flow. And it tells us that it's running currently. And it's running here and telling us. And evidently, I've got something going on where uh, recalculating. I thought I had it where it should run correctly. But something is causing the model to um, a problem very early on. And so we've got to fix that. So um, it's telling us, OK, the model is divergent. Please check the model setup, reset, uh, and restart the run. So I'll close this right now. Actually, I'll tell it to abort and remove this. So this window, this run queue, you can have all kinds of different things queued up to be running. When this one finishes, um, it'll start the next one. So we want to just remove this for right now and close. I'll go back to my folder and kind of show you a little bit more information. So this is the same folder we were in you know, before we started but we actually started uh, CMS and it was running. So there's a few more files here. There's this tail file. Now, so this is the correct version um, that from this world tail that CMS actually uses. There is a diagnostic file that holds some information about maybe where some things were going wrong. There's a morphology file that holds all the sediment transport information. So Transport rates, the morphology change. Uh, no, actually not tra transport rates, but just the morphology through time and the morphology change through time. Um, sediment concentration, if you turn that on, a couple of other things. And then there's the transport rates. There's a velocity file. And then there's a water surface elevation file. And they all hold solution output. So we can bring those into SMS and view those results at some point. It's also saved a CMS underscore DIAG dot text. That's basically, if you're not running it and looking at the screen, and if we open that up, it's just some information about how it was set up. And then after it was running and going, what's going on? Um, and you see it was running fine for a while. But hot start out a couple of times. And then all of a sudden, um, it starts having a little bit of an issue um, around time step 13. And if CMS will try to cut the time step a little bit and save you some, some time. If you can lower the time step a couple of times when you're in really strong forcing situations or where there's a lot of stuff going, um, sometimes it'll lower this time step until it can converge, start getting solutions, and then after things quiet down a little bit, it will go back up to the maximum that you had started. So um, seeing these values go down is not a problem um, as long as they go right back up and you can continue. If they come all the way down, they'll only cut the time step like six times. And then it says, OK, I'm going to give up. There's something else going on. Um, you've got to figure that out and then restart. So just a little bit more information about what's shown here. Let me just go up to the top here. Um, so basically, we've got the time step. We've got what the current um, DT, or the time step value is um, in seconds. 
and this is the actual time that's elapsed since the start, and this is the number of cells that are currently active. And this number will change depending on wetting and drying. So that's why this is 854, 815, 49, and etc. So then we come down to this couple of lines, and this is flow-related information. It took six iterations at, for this time step to come to a, a solution. Um, and the residual for pressure was this, the residual for U velocity was this, the residual for Z velocity was that. So you can kind of look at these, and these numbers should be on the order of either minus four or smaller. If it is larger than that, that's when um, SMS, I mean CMS, starts to cut the time step. You see there's four here, and so it cuts the time step to 300, it remains four. I cut it again, and it just didn't get any better, so it finally gave up. Um, same thing for sediment transport. There's a uh, concentration. Uh, I think that's what the CTK is, and it's a residual. And as you start moving sediment, it would um, give you values there. So um, I'm going to go in and see if I can just quickly see what might be going on with this particular run. I have another one set up that I think uh, was running earlier, so it's probably in something that I did when I was setting these uh, data sets up. So let me just look at this real quick. Um, go into quad tree and turn off this range. And also I will turn off the cell edges so I can kind of see what's going on. So I look at these branding values. Um, I don't, I don't really see anything that's out of the ordinary. I mean, these are just the values that we're starting with. Um, might be able to do a little bit more with that. And um, D50. I don't see much of an issue here either. Um, so what I'm, just for the purpose of this, since we're uh, running, um, one of the things that I've just been reminded, so we have um, this diagnostic output and we have a certain node where the water surface elevation, where it's telling us that it was having an issue. This is the largest value for any cell in the grid at these locations. And so this is another place where we can actually go and check. So we can look for um, cell number 53,084. And so let me just do that real quick. And hopefully it's easy to find. Um, sometimes these are so small that it's hard to, to find real quick. So let me zoom out. You can go under cells, find a certain cell, and I'll put in that number, 053084. This is kind of stuff I was going to go over on Friday as far as post-processing and being able to do a few extra things. Um, so it looks like there's something in the actual node. And it's just hard to see where this one particular cell is located. Um, there's so many cells, and they're so small in some areas. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time doing this. But normally you would see a cell that was selected right then. Let me just try this one more time. And it does have one selected. Um, as I see down here in the status bar, I just cannot find it at the moment. So um, I'm not going to worry about this right now. And we'll just load in uh, one that I know was working earlier. Um, we can go into a little bit of this if we have time 
on Friday, um, debugging and things like that. I think we're going to have maybe um, 30 or 40 extra minutes on that final day. So I'm going to go back in and do this one after export. And I'll open this one up. And this is one I had previously gotten together. Uh, it's essentially the same thing um, as far as the manning and everything else. So let me just go in and I will export. And you can see the cursor turns. And when it comes back, then it's, it's done with everything that it's working on. All right, it's finished, and so we'll go in and we'll launch. All right, so that one's running, it's done. This is now running, and hopefully it'll run a little bit smoother, so we can actually see a little bit um, longer of a run and uh, eventually look at some of the output from this. So it started the issue around time step 13 a few minutes ago, so let's see. Um, so yeah, it looks like it's going a little bit farther. I'm not exactly sure what it was. I'll try to figure that out while we're um, away after this webinar, and then I'll mention it tomorrow and see and let you know what I found out. So as it's running, it's giving a little bit more information that's actually written into this file. It's actually giving you every, the first and every 10 iteration plus the last one. Uh, some information. You can see how um, the first iteration um, and then it converges on the solution um, eventually. So I'm not going to let this run too long. We've got five hours. Um, but I was just going to go ahead and finish this maybe after six hours and pull in the solution really quick and show you what it looks like. And then probably on uh, tomorrow afternoon or Friday morning, we'll have a little time to go in and look at some post-processing and different things that you can do. Uh, but I wanted to go ahead and give a, a few minutes to um, look at that right now. So this is going pretty smoothly. I'm just going to abort now. And so it finishes up. I remove that. And so what I can do is open this folder, and we need to go down into that directory structure like I mentioned earlier. And you see the various uh, files. And you notice there's not a diagnostic file, so it doesn't run into any errors to even write to that file yet. So what we can do is just one by one, or you can select more than one, and just look at the results. And so I know after six hours, there's probably not much morphology change, but there might be some uh, water surface elevation change or something like that. I think I have some partial solutions already loaded or saved that might be a little bit farther along. Yeah, it looks like they're larger files. So I'll just pull those in real quick. So I'll look at morphology. And so I'll change the format a little bit so I'm not distracted by all the edges and these different um, components. So when I pull that in, notice the folder here um, that was created. So this is basically that simulation label that we gave it, and it has a depth. And so this is not um, only one depth. This is a depth through time. And so you can see the various times. So what this list down here is this 1,800,628 is a certain number of days from a specific day in the past. I think it's January 1st of 1950 or something like that. And that's what SMS uses as its reference date. Um, so what we can do is change the appearance and look at the absolute time. I'll show this again on Friday, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time working on this. But this will actually show you the actual date and the uh, hours of this output. So if I look at the depth, um, and I 
look through time, you would start to see some changes. Of course, this is all within or just after the initial um, hydrologic ramp that we set up. And so you, you wouldn't be getting um, a whole lot of movement this early. Um, there is no magnitude, um, like a mag change, magnitude change. But we can calculate it real quick. And so what we can do is take some steps. We'll go into the data set toolbox, into that data calculator, and I'll choose this depth. We see all the time steps. And we're going to use all of them. And we'll add that to the calculator. And then from that, we'll subtract the initial Z value. And so we can either come to this value, or we can go and just use the initial time as the output from the zero time. So either way, we'll work fine. And this is a um, magnitude difference. And so we have a certain range that it's looking at, which is way too big. Um, if we look at this data set, we can get some information about it. And we see that um, the minimum is a certain value, the maximum is a certain value. It's still pretty small, um, but we should be able to look at this a little bit easier. So let's go to the contours and just show um, Hopefully we can see a little bit of this. I'm just going to specify a range that's kind of symmetric. So let's say 0 0.05 to 0 0.5. And just see what we can see here. Um, anyway, I'll try to run a little bit longer so we have some actual results. It's not really showing up. Uh, much of anything here. It's only a day into it, and not a lot of sediment has been moving around. So I'll run this and get a longer time period. We'll show it on Friday. We're working on post-processing. So I'm just going to show you real quick how you can bring these in and look at them. Um, so in this particular one, um, I'll do this again and pull in the velocity vectors. And just they show up a little bit differently. They are vectors. And so you would have to go in and turn on to the display of vectors and then how to visualize those. And so they show up something like this. And so as we start moving around the vectors, um, the velocities start moving in and out. And you can see, for the most part, it's on an ebb. And so we have the flow coming out of the inlet. So as you zoom in, you can see a little bit more information. Uh, we'll be getting into all of this during our post-processing on Friday. Um, I just wanted to quickly show that. So hopefully, you know, that kind of shows how to set up a grid, how to start a simulation, set up the parameters. Uh, all the different data sets of how you want to run as far as your landing in and your um, data set V50 values, things like that, um, and then run them and pull those back in. So that's about all I wanted to cover for this portion. I still have some time, um, and so I'm going to go over the CMS wave, a little bit of background on that. Um, I didn't feel that there was enough time actually get in and start working with it. And so this is just explanations of the model, not necessarily a description of how to do it in the interface yet. So that will be tomorrow morning, first thing, or at the very beginning of our talk. And um, then we'll be going in and how to create a wave grid and how to set up a spectra, how to get your spectra from gauges and things like that. So I'll be uh, going over all of that tomorrow. And then we'll be interacting the waves in the flow together. Uh, waves add more energy to the situation, to your area, and they'll pick up more sediment and move it around a little bit better. So we should get a little bit more information. So right now I'm just going to close all this and go to that other presentation.